Welcome to The Mushroom Show. My name is Tony Shields. This is episode 24, and this is the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. In this episode of The Mushroom Show, we're going to be trying to answer the question, how many species of mushrooms actually exist? It's a much tougher question to answer than you might think, and the implications of that answer are much larger than you might think. We're also going to be commemorating Roland Griffiths. He was a major contributor to the current academic knowledge base of psilocybin and its vast potential and really one of the major driving forces behind the renaissance of this molecule. So if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. And if you want to see future episodes of the show, make sure you hit that subscribe button as well. Let's jump into the show. So have you ever been walking through the woods on a mushroom hunting mission? Maybe you have a mushroom identification app on your phone. Maybe you have a mushroom identification book. Perhaps you're even brave enough to carry along with you Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora. This book weighs more than a brick and lists over 2,000 different species, and you come across something that you just can't seem to identify. It doesn't look all that special, but it also doesn't quite fit the description of anything in the book. Well, it's possible that you have found a brand new species never before described by science. And while you may think this type of eureka discovery is a once in a lifetime lottery winning type experience, the truth is that the vast majority of fungal species in the world have yet to be named. In other words, there are way more species of mushrooms that are still completely unknown to science than those that are formally described. They are not in any book or any app anywhere because no one has ever found them before. Now, of course, it's not an equal distribution. You are actually more likely to find a mushroom that's common or something that's really abundant. And the reason why some species have yet to be discovered is because they are either super rare or maybe they only have some minute difference at the cellular level. Or maybe they are a microscopic fungi or maybe they only exist in the stomach acid of some weird and obscure insect. But still, the fact that there are untold numbers of fungal species that we have not yet discovered could have some pretty profound implications. For example, think about how many innovations, compounds, and life-improving technologies come from fungi. Things like penicillin, which is derived from a fungus and changed the world with its antibiotic powers. Consider fungal beta-glucans and triterpenes, which are found in functional mushrooms like reishi and chaga and turkey tail, or hericinones and aranacines found in lion's mane, which are used for brain health. And of course, psilocybin, which is clearly becoming super important for addressing mental health concerns, among other potential medicinal applications. But what are the numbers? How many species of fungi actually exist? Well, this is a much harder question to answer than you might think. The truth is, no one really knows, and we may never know the exact number. But estimates do exist, and it seems like researchers are getting closer and closer to the true number all the time. A new report by the Kew Royal Botanic Gardens called The State of the World's Plants and Fungi 2023 explains the meticulous process of identifying new species of mushrooms and the urgency in trying to find them all while we still can. The report gives a brief history on the prior attempts to guess the number of mushrooms in the world, which ranged all the way from 250,000 on the low end to 19 million on the high end, which is quite the wide range. If the true estimate fell on either end of that range, the other end would be off by nearly a factor of 100. Needless to say, there's not a lot of confidence baked into those numbers. But before we can pontificate on how many species of mushrooms do exist, we first have to understand how many species of mushrooms that we already know exist. In other words, how many different types of fungi and mushrooms have been identified, have been named, and have been classified. As of today, that number is currently 155,000. This includes both the fleshy fungi, so mushrooms that produce a large fruiting body, and also things like smuts, rusts, and microscopic fungi, where there can be dozens of different species in a single teaspoon of soil. That is one of the reasons why it's so hard to figure out how many of these things actually exist. The diversity of the fungal kingdom really is astonishing. And just because some fungi don't grow into mushrooms doesn't mean that they're not super important. Think about yeast, for example, or penicillin pretty important contributions, even though you wouldn't really notice them growing in the forest. Put it all in perspective and to give you an idea of where the number of species of fungi stands compared to other groups, consider that we currently know of 74,420 species of animals and about 400,000 species of plants 
and about 1.4 million species of insects. That puts fungi in third place in terms of diversity, based on known species. But here's the crazy part. New estimates using a variety of techniques, including fungus to plant ratios, scaling laws, actual versus previously known number of species, and DNA-based studies, gives the current best estimate of 2.5 million species of fungi. That means that fungi are very likely the second largest kingdom behind the animals. But think about it this way. If we only know of about 155,000 species of fungi, that means there could be well over 2 million different species of fungi, or over 90% of the entire kingdom that have yet to be discovered. Just think about the potential there. When you consider that the fungi we do know about contribute so incredibly much to our world, with one study estimating the global economic contribution of fungi at over 54 trillion, what happens if you multiply that by 10? But there is a problem. At the current rate that we're identifying new species of mushrooms, which is pretty impressively about 2,500 new species being identified every single year, it would take us over 800 years to identify them all. And that might be too slow, because species may be disappearing at an even faster rate. In my opinion, it is very likely that there is a world-changing fungi out there somewhere, maybe even a few of them, maybe even a hundred of them, that might never get discovered, that will never have a chance to change our world for the better. And when you look at it that way, the true urgency of finding all the fungi becomes a lot more clear. Because even if we were able to 10x the amount of fungi we find every single year, it would still take about 100 years to find all the ones that currently exist. But there may be a way to speed that up. As it stands now, the way to identify a new species, you need a physical specimen. That means you need to actually go out and find it in the wild, or it needs to be cultured in a lab. But according to the State of the World's Fungi Report, some scientists are advocating for being able to identify fungi from their DNA sequence alone, which would allow scientists to catalog 50,000 new species every single year, a rate that would allow us to classify all the world's fungi in a few decades rather than a few centuries. Now, a lot of people might read this report and find it actually kind of scary because it does go on to talk about the fact that there may be thousands of species that are threatened and we really haven't done a proper assessment to figure out what those species are and how many of them might just be lost forever. But I think the overall takeaway is pretty exciting. Just again, think about how much potential is just sitting out there. Sometimes as humans, it feels like we have it all figured out, right? Everything is known and space really is the only frontier, the final frontier as it's called. But you could literally spend every single waking hour trying to find new species of mushrooms, a kingdom that has world-changing implications and has brought absolutely marvelous compounds and technologies into our world, and you wouldn't even put a dent in the total number of species that could be found. I've said it before, but we may have been born a little too late to explore the world, a little too early to explore the universe, but I think we're all born just in time to explore the mycoverse, and that's pretty exciting. There is really so much to learn, so much to be discovered, and I for one am definitely happy to be on that mission. So now you know there are approximately 2.5 million species of fungi in the world. And out of that, only about 155,000 or so have actually been discovered. And even a smaller portion, about 100 species or so, are actually commonly cultivated or commonly used by humans. And an even smaller amount of that, probably only about a dozen or so species, are considered the superstars, the functional mushrooms. These are mushrooms like reishi and chaga and turkey tail and cordyceps and lion's mane. Mushrooms that people are using every day for all sorts of things like immunity, energy, brain health, and more. Being called a functional mushroom is an incredibly high bar to pass. These are amazingly special types of mushrooms. Which is why you shouldn't accept anything but the best when it comes to your functional mushroom supplements. Fresh cat mushroom supplements are made from organic whole mushroom fruiting body and thoroughly extracted to make their unique and powerful active compounds more bioavailable so that you can get the most out of your mushrooms. If you want to try it out, just search for Fresh Cap Mushrooms on Amazon or use code The Mushroom Show at freshcap.com to get 10% off your first order. Let's get back to the show. 
these days it almost seems like old news to talk about psilocybin and its major potential as a healing modality for things like end of life anxiety, for things like treatment resistant depression, for things like addiction, and countless other mental health concerns. And that's because the narrative has shifted. Psilocybin, which was once poorly understood and often mischaracterized as a dangerous drug, has completely reinvented its public image in the last two decades. But that didn't happen in a vacuum. It took a lot of work from a lot of people advocating for the potential of these mushrooms in order to really shift that narrative and kick off a whole new era, the so-called psychedelic renaissance. One individual who played a leading role was Roland Griffiths, a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neurosciences at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the founding director of the Johns Hopkins Center on Psychedelic and Consciousness Research. Roland recently passed away on October 16th at the age of 77 after a battle with colon cancer, and I wanted to go over some of the contributions that he and his team made in terms of the advancement of psilocybin as a medicine. I never met Roland or had the chance to interview him for this show, but he was well known in the mushroom community, with Paul Stamets saying of his passing, He was not only the most significant pioneer in decades unveiling the potential of psilocybin as a therapeutic medicine through his work at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, he was, is a kind person, with great compassion, courage, and indeed an intellectual giant. Roland Griffiths was introduced to the idea of psychedelics through meditation. Although before psilocybin, he had been studying caffeine, mood-altering drugs, and these so-called drugs of abuse. Meditation, however, got him to go deep into the idea of nature, of emergent altered states of consciousness, and spiritual experience. It left Roland wondering if there was something we could learn from these altered states caused by psychedelics, specifically psilocybin. Roland himself admitted that he was quite skeptical of a lot of the enthusiasm in the psychedelic community, saying that it was kind of over the top, which is actually a pretty good starting point for a rigorous scientist in this field. Eventually, Roland became familiar with the research that was done in the 1960s, which focused pretty heavily on psilocybin evoking these so-called mystical type experiences. But that research stopped, mainly due to negative press and a general crackdown on any type of psychedelics research. That is until the landmark paper published in 2006 by Roland Griffiths and his team at Johns Hopkins titled, Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experiences Having Substantial and Sustained Personal Meaning and Spiritual Significance. And this was the paper that really kind of turbocharged this psilocybin renaissance or this psychedelic renaissance. The idea that these things could actually be good. These things are pretty interesting to look into. And it really started changing the narrative among the media and the public, but also among the rest of academia. And not just because they were able to do the research legally, but because the results of the research were actually pretty astonishing. And when you think of this kind of research, you're probably wanting to picture like white lab coats and hospitals. But one of the things that made this group stand apart was their focus on trying to create the right set and setting. Again, these are lessons learned from the 1950s and 60s. You've seen the images of the participants in these studies. They're kind of lying on a couch and there's nice soft lighting and they have like plants around them and they have these eye shades over their eyes. This was all part of this protocol. This was all part of this study design. In the 2006 study, participants were given the equivalent of about three grams of psilocybin mushrooms, which is a high dose, or a placebo, which was Ritalin, over two or three sessions. So they all ended up getting placebo at some point, even though they weren't told at the time of the dose. The clinicians didn't know either. The study was so-called double-blind, which is the gold standard for this type of research. They measured things like blood pressure and heart rate, but what they really wanted to know was basically how impactful the experiences were psychologically, or as they put it in the paper, to evaluate the acute and longer-term psychological effects of high-dose psilocybin relative to comparison compound administered under comfortable, supportive conditions. After the experience, they got the participants to fill out a number of surveys. This was done directly directly after the experience and also two months out. What was astonishing to the researchers, and maybe not that surprising to anyone who has experienced high dose psilocybin before, is that 67% of the participants rated this experience as either the single most meaningful experience of their lives 
or the top five most meaningful experience of their lives, similar to the birth of a first child or the death of a parent. Further, almost half of the participants also rated it as the top five most spiritually significant experiences as well. Again, this might seem like old news now because I guess it is. I mean, this was done over 20 years ago, but it will always be amazing to me that a few grams of a mushroom can have such profound effects. And this paper did really kick off a bit of a media circus, but this time it was a lot more positive and maybe even hopeful. It left the door wide open for future research and eventually the likely introduction of psilocybin mushrooms into a new legal framework or medical framework, however that might unfold. After this paper, Roland Griffiths continued his pursuit of better understanding the potential impact of psilocybin, doing research on end of life anxiety, meditation in psilocybin, and smoking cessation. Again, the results were pretty remarkable, and it's likely research that you have at least heard of. One of them was seeing if psilocybin could be used to ease end-of-life anxiety for cancer patients. Again, something that today is kind of well known, but the reason why that is the case, at least in part, was because of a 2016 paper titled Psilocybin Produces Substantial and Sustained Decreases in Depression and Anxiety in Patients with Life-Threatening Cancer a randomized double-blind trial. In short, they gave high-dose psilocybin to cancer patients in much the same way as the 2006 study with proper set and setting, and the results showed a 92% improvement for anxiety after five weeks and 79% after six months. Pretty amazing results from a single exposure to a substance. Another study published in 2014 looked at whether or not psilocybin could help people quit smoking. I find this interesting in a few ways. First of all, quitting smoking can be insanely hard. So if a mushroom of all things can help with that, well, that in itself is pretty remarkable. But secondly, there are people who kind of like lump all these types of substances or so-called drugs into a single bucket and just say that they are all addictive. And what this study could potentially show is that not only are psilocybin mushrooms non-addictive, but they also might be able to be used to dethrone other addictions. The results from this study are similarly impressive. For long-term smokers with a history of attempting to quit using other methods, a single dose of psilocybin resulted in four out of five participants no longer smoking six months after the study. That's 80%. I certainly haven't heard anything else with that kind of a success rate for smoking cessation, so the results are pretty amazing. Anecdotally, I've heard that mushrooms somehow force people to look at things from other perspectives, and in terms of smoking cessation, it can make them kind of see it from a different angle and maybe question why they you're doing something that could be so potentially damaging to their health and it makes it a lot easier to just quit. So it is pretty amazing when you think about it, the shift in narrative from call it the late 90s when everyone thought, you know, mushrooms make your brain bleed or something to today when these ideas around psilocybin for things like end of life anxiety and smoking cessation and all these other potential therapeutic benefits are kind of well known. Well, the reason for that mostly is because of Roland Griffiths and his team at Johns Hopkins. And some people will say that we are kind of in a psilocybin research bubble or we're in some sort of psychedelic renaissance bubble and it's all about to crash down. And all that may be the case, it is pretty clear that there's still a lot of research going on. We are probably still in the early stages of really understanding the potential of psilocybin and what it could potentially do for our society. Even today, if you go to the website for the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Johns Hopkins, you can see that there's plenty of ongoing research. So the spores that were sown by Roland Griffiths and his team long ago are continuing to bear mushrooms. One final note, as I was researching this, I was reading Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, where he interviews a lot of people, but Roland Griffiths was one of them. And there's this piece of dialogue here where they're talking about what happens after you die. And again, Roland Griffiths was kind of a strict and, and rigorous scientist, but through his meditation and through some of the research he was doing with psilocybin kind of caused him to think about all these different things. So in this bit of dialogue, Roland says, I can't think of anything more interesting than what I may or may not discover at the time that I die. That is the most interesting question going. Western materialism says the switch gets turned off and that's it. But there are so many other descriptions. It could be a beginning. Wouldn't that be amazing?
And although that is hard or impossible to say for sure, we can all agree that his work here on psilocybin made an absolute huge impact. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the channel get out to more people. And if you want to see future episodes of the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well. We appreciate it so much. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.